And I should say that the fact that all of our examples involve um, linear transformations which, after all, need not be a priori. I could imagine in some perverse world I had a function of the phi's here evaluated minus x and t, but not a linear function, comes, of course, from the fact that in all of our examples, the kinetic energy is of that standard form. And that means nonlinear transformations will turn the kinetic energy from a quadratic function of the fields to a, um, to a nonlinear function of the fields, and therefore they don't come up in this sort of work. We could, however, be perverse and, for example, rewrite things so that if I have an ordinary theory with two fields in it, phi 1 and phi 2, and it's just perfectly symmetric, out of sheer perversity, I choose to introduce fields phi 1 prime is phi 1, and phi 2 prime is, say, phi 2 plus a phi 1 quantity squared. Okay. Then my kinetic energy would look rather disgusting. And my ordinary isospin transformations discussed earlier that turn phi 1 into phi 2 would look like horrible nonlinear transformations. That's a silly thing to do, but it is not an absolutely forbidden thing to do. So there's nothing, nothing sacred about linear transformation laws of the fields. It's the, it's the bilinear structure of the kinetic energy that makes linear transformation laws of such interest to us. Okay? Yeah. Other questions? <clears throat> now, of the uh, famous discrete symmetries known and loved by physicists, I have left one undiscussed, and I would like to devote the first part of this lecture to discussing that one, and that is time reversal. Time reversal, as you all know, since you've either taken Physics 251 or an analogous course, is rather peculiar in that unlike all the other symmetries we have discussed until now, it is not represented by a unitary operator. It is represented by an anti-unitary operator. I say you all know it, but some of you may have forgotten it. And therefore, I will uh, bore you for five minutes by recapitulating the situation for time reversal. In the simplest non-relativistic case, that will serve as an aid memoir. And you all remember the generalization, so I don't have to make my notes, if you remember this. And therefore, I don't have to make my notations too complicated. So I will consider a particle in one dimension moving, into, moving in a potential. The classical theory, the classical Hamiltonian or Lagrangian, is invariant under the famous time reversal transformation time reversal about the point zero. Q of t goes into Q of minus t. And of course, since p is proportional to Q, bar, Q dot, p of t goes into minus p of minus t. That is to say, if you take a motion picture of the motions of this classical system and run the motion picture, run the reel through the projector backwards, you will obtain a motion perfectly consistent with the classical equations of motion. One's first guess is any symmetry is like any other symmetry, and therefore there should be a unitary operator, which I'll call u sub t, that affects this motion, affects this transformation in the quantum theory. This, of course, runs one into a grinding contradiction almost immediately because we know from the canonical commutators that q with p at equal time, say time 0 is equal to time as any other, is i. Applying u of t to the right-hand side of this equation, we find u of t adjoint which is, of course, equal to u of t adjoint P of, uh, sorry. U of T U of T adjoint P of zero U of T equals, if our hypothesis is correct, minus Q 
Q of zero, P of zero, equals U of T adjoint I U of T, which is unfortunately not minus I, but I. <laughs> Thus, we have obtained an immediate contradiction with our hypothesis. So the answer to this is not question mark, but no. <laughs> The resolution of this difficulty, I presume, is well known to you. Time reversal is not a unitary operator, but it is an anti-unitary operator. I will remind you of the definition of an anti-unitary operator, an anti-linear anti-unitary operator. In order to write this definition, the Dirac notation, one reason the Dirac notation is so wonderful is that a lot of um, um, of uh, facts about linear operators are embedded in it subliminally to automate calculations. And anti-linear operators are therefore difficult to describe in direct notation. So instead of calling my vectors by bras and kets, I will use an alternative notation in which I just label them by lowercase Latin letters, the vectors in Hilbert space. And instead of talking about the inner product AB, I will label that as a comma b. <clears throat> now I can tell you what a unitary linear operator is, u. A unitary a linear operator is firstly linear. If alpha and beta are any two number complex numbers, and a and b are any two vectors in Hilbert space, it obeys this equation, alpha ua plus beta ub which is called linear and obeys ua ub equals a b, which is the condition that it's unitary, that it preserves the norm. Actually, to be unitary, I have to add the statement that there is an inverse to u. But I'll take that for granted. An antilinear operator is traditionally represented by an omega one of the few instances of felicitous notation in theoretical physics, since an omega is a u upside down. <laughs> alpha a plus beta b equals alpha star omega a plus beta star omega b. And this is antilinear, the equation that defines antilinearity. And omega a omega b equals a b complex conjugate. And this is the equation that defines anti-unitarity. Such operators certainly exist. A simple example in one-dimensional quantum mechanics is complex conjugation of the Schrodinger wave function which obeys all of these conditions. The complex conjugate of a linear superposition of two wave functions is the superposition of the complex conjugates with complex conjugate coefficients. Likewise, if I complex conjugate both factors in the inner product, I complex conjugate the inner product. Are there questions? This is familiar material I am recapitulating. But it's possible there is someone in this room who has just wandered in out of the African jungle and uh, has not heard about anti-unitary operators. If so, ask a question. In the absence of questions, I presume you know the elementary algebra of these objects, that the product of two anti-unitary operators is a unitary operator, the product of an anti-unitary and a unitary is an anti-unitary, et cetera. And you may even have heard of Wigner's theorem, which tells you that under rather loose conditions, if you just search for a continuous operator that preserves the norm of the inner product, then that operator has to be either unitary or anti-unitary. So there's not a, in the study of symmetries, as Wigner pointed out, all one really has to worry about on a priori grounds are unitary and anti-unitary operators. There is no need worrying that someday you will find a symmetry that is implemented by a quasi or unitary operator or some other entity not yet thought of by mathematicians. <laughs> Now, 
time reversal, and is of course the resolution of this paradox, is affected by the fact that time, re the resolution is that time reversal is affected by an anti-unitary operator rather than a unitary one. Of course, we can't write adjoints for anti-unitary operators. It's an undefined concept, but we can write inverses. So this is omega t inverse, q of t, omega t. And this is omega t inverse, p of t, omega t. Now when we come to our paradox, q of 0, p of 0 equals i, we find it is no paradox at all. The reason is as follows. Omega t inverse, q of 0, p of 0, omega t, is as before, minus q of 0, p of 0 the unitarity or anti-unitarity of the operators never entered into this part of the calculation, just the fact that an operator times its inverse was 1. Omega t inverse i omega t, on the other hand, is minus omega t inverse omega t i. Because whenever we drag a complex number, through an anti-unitary operator, we complex conjugate it, and the complex conjugate of i is minus i. And this is, of course, minus i. <laughs> Thus, the right and left-hand sides of the equation match, and the paradox disappears. Indeed, as you know, for this particular problem, it is easy to find the anti-unitary operator that affects time reversal. It is complex conjugation in the x representation. That turns uh, x into x, and it turns p, which is 1 over i, d by dx, into minus p because of the i. So much for a lightning summary of the situation in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. We now wish to take our standard field theoretic system, let us say for the moment, the free field of mass mu and find a time reversal operator. So we are interested in the system defined by the Lagrange density, 1 half d mu phi squared minus mu squared over 2 phi squared. I pick this one because we can explicitly write the operators on the state space, since we know how to solve the theory. Um, I will find a time reversal operator. Everything I said about parity also applies to time reversal, of course. I can multiply it by any internal symmetry and obtain an equally good time reversal operator. <coughs> Let's try, just for a novelty, to figure out what omega t must be working directly with the states, the opposite direction from which we worked before, and then showing what it does to the fields. That's just for a novelty. We could do it the other way. It is rather more convenient to study omega p t in a relativistic theory than omega t, that is to say the product of parity and time reversal. The reason is very simple. Acting on x, p t multiplies everything by minus 1 which commutes with the Lorentz group, all four components of x, whereupon time reversal just multiplies t by minus 1 and therefore does not commute with general Lorentz transformations. <coughs> now, what do we expect pt to do to a single particle state? Well, if I have a particle whose vector is represented by my hand here, its momentum vector, parity will reverse the sign, and time reversal will reverse it again. So I expect pt to do nothing to the momentum of the particle. Therefore, I define the anti-unitary operator, p omega pt, acting on a complete set of basis states, to simply turn them into the complete set of basis states. This defines the operator, 
because for an anti-unitary operator like a unitary one, if you give it on its action on a complete orthonormal basis, you give it everywhere. Notice this does not imply as it would for a unitary operator that omega pt is 1 because it's an anti-unitary operator and therefore although it turns these states into themselves, it doesn't turn i times these states into themselves. It turns them into minus them. <laughs> i times these states. <coughs> now, okay, that's our guess. This obviously I've defined an anti-unitary operator, which is symmetry if anything is. It can be used with Lorentz transformations the Hamiltonian and the momentum. That's surely good enough to be a symmetry. <laughs> Let's figure out what it does to the fields. Fine. Well, let's begin with the annihilation and creation operators. And this isn't one, but the formulas that define the annihilation and creation operators only involve real numbers. So from those who don't see that, it's not one. <laughs> So one easily deduces that omega pt times an annihilation operator is an annihilation operator times omega pt. Or equivalently, multiplying by omega pt inverse and changing the right and left hand side. Equals a sub p. Sure looks like one so far. By the same reasoning, we have a similar equation with a sub p adjoint replacing a p. Now, what about the field? Here comes the cute trick. The field, as you recall, is integral d q p 2 pi to the 3 halves square root of 2 omega p a p e to the minus i p dot x plus Hermitian conjugate. Now, when I apply omega p t inverse and omega p t to this, what happens? Well, nothing happens to the dqp, nothing happens to the 2 pi to the 3 halves, nothing happens to the square root of 2 omega p, nothing happens to the ap. But ah, the e to the minus i p dot x gets <laughs> complex conjugated. <laughs> and likewise, the e to the plus i p dot x lurking here under the Hermitian conjugation sign symbol. So I get phi of minus x, which is exactly what I would want for pt operation. It turns the field at the space-time point x into the field at the space-time point minus x. There's some questions? Ask me, don't ask each other. <laughs> Unless the question is, why does he dress funny or something like that? <laughs> it's answered. How do you write down the 30 equation that works? Hmm? I write down the equation that defines AP, which I don't bother to do explicitly. I just remind you that it only involves real numbers. So in this equation, the fact that omega P is, T is not the identity operator never appears. Okay? If I have any equation defining an operator in terms of these states where it only has real matrix elements, then it will commute with omega PT. Is that a satisfactory answer? Do you want me? This concludes the discussion of time reversal, which is rather simple because we're dealing with scalar particles. When we lay much later in this course, when we deal with particles with spin, time reversal will be somewhat more complicated, just as it is somewhat more complicated in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. This also concludes the dis immediate, the general discussion of symmetries. We are now going to turn to a topic that in one guise or other will occupy us for the rest of the semester. That is to say, the discussion of perturbation theory of scattering. This will lead us into Feynman diagrams, complicated homework problems, worries about renormalization, and everything else. Okay, but we begin at the beginning. I said perturbation theory of scattering and that's because I want to divide the problem into two pieces, at least our first go through. 
First, I will discuss perturbation theory, that is to say, how one solves quantum dynamics in perturbation theory, how one finds the transition matrix, or whatever you wish to discuss, for between states at finite times in perturbation theory. And then secondly, I will discuss the asymptotic problem, that is to say, given such a solution, how does one extract from it scattering matrix elements? Okay. So firstly, I'll discuss perturbative dynamics, and then I will discuss scattering. I will first begin by reminding you of the uh, two pictures that play such a large role in uh, ordinary quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger and Heisenberg pictures. Uh, in the I, and therefore, I will put little subscripts on things to indicate we are whether we are in the Schrodinger picture or the Heisenberg picture. Firstly, the Schrodinger picture. Schrodinger, I mean, my German pronunciation, uh, like, like my English pronunciation, is sometimes weak. In the Schrodinger picture, the fundamental dynamical variables, which I'll indicate by a subscript T, the P's and the Q's, are time independent. Um, I won't bother to put indices on these things. I'll speak as if there's only one P and one Q, just to simplify equations. Everything I say will be true if there were a million P's and a million Q's. Are time independent. The states, on the other hand, obey a rather complicated equation, known as the Schrodinger equation, i d by dt, psi of t in the Schrodinger picture, equals h of p, q, and perhaps also t, acting on psi Schrodinger. The fundamental dynamical problem in the Schrodinger picture is given a state, oh, psi, psi of t, I should say, given the state psi of t at any one time to determine it at any other time. We define a matrix called the, or an operator called the U operator or the time evolution operator that is defined to such as it solves this equation. It obeys the differential equation, U of, well, it's defined. I'll write down its definition. Psi of t equals u of t of t prime psi of t prime. That is to say, the u operator is that operator which takes the state at time t prime and produces a state at time t. It is obviously a linear operator, since the Schrodinger equation is a linear equation, and is a unitary operator because the Schrodinger equation preserves probability conserves probability. <coughs> U in addition, let me write some of that down. The linearity is in, is in our notation. U of t and t prime adjoint is U of t and t prime inverse. And U of t and t prime obeys what we might call a sort of, sort of group property. U of t and t prime, U of t prime and t double prime is u of t prime and t double prime. Uh, t and t double prime. That is to say, if I go from time t double prime to time t prime, and then from time t prime to time t, that's the same as going from t double prime to t in one fell swoop. Um, the U matrix obeys a differential equation with a boundary condition. The differential equation is a direct consequence of the Schrodinger equation. I d by dt, u of t and t prime equals h. I won't bother to write the explicit dependence on p and q, but it depends on t. u of t and t prime, and the boundary condition u of t prime and t prime equals 1. Thus, solving dynamics in the Schrodinger picture is equivalent to uh, finding this U operator. Any questions?
<coughs> the Heisenberg picture is the same thing with a uh, time-dependent unitary transformation. In the Heisenberg picture, in the Heisenberg picture, the states are defined to be time-independent. And just so we can compare the two pictures, at the arbitrarily chosen time zero, we identify the Heisenberg state with the Schrodinger state. The Heisenberg operators, on the other hand, the fundamental P and Q operators, are defined to be the U operator, U of T and zero adjoint, QH of zero. U of t and 0, and qh of 0 equals qs of 0. And likewise for p. I won't bother to write down the equation for p. Uh, the reason we define things this way is that uh, the uh, Heisenberg picture operator evaluated between Heisenberg picture states at any fixed time is equivalent to the corresponding Schrodinger picture operator evaluated between Schrodinger picture states at the same time. It's just in one case you've got the U operator on the states, and the other case you've got the U operator on the operators, but the combined expression is the same. general dynamics, and uh, not the corporation, this is the general quantum dynamics, independent of perturbation theory, and I would now like to turn to uh, per perturbation theory computations of the U-matrix. Notice, please, that solving dynamics in the Heisenberg picture is tantamount to solving it in the Schrodinger picture. They both are equivalent to finding the U-operator. Therefore, I would like to consider Oh, I should say, a fact I should have written down but didn't. If H of P, Q, and T is simply a function of P and Q, that is to say, if it does not depend on T, then we can at least write a formal expression for the U matrix, which is fairly trivial. It's E to the minus I H T minus T prime. It gets more complicated if H is time independent. I would now like to consider a class of problems where H of P, Q, and T is a free Hamiltonian, let's say in the Schrodinger picture, plus a time dependent, a, a Hamiltonian called H naught that does not depend on the time, plus a Hamiltonian called H, uh, H prime that does depend on the, may depend on the time or may not. In fact, in the real world, ultimately, we are, of course, interested in real world dynamics where the total Hamiltonian is time dependent. But it's frequently useful to consider problems in which we have time dependent Hamiltonians when we are doing some approximations to the real world. For example, if we have an electron in a synchrotron, we don't normally want to have to solve the quantum mechanics of the synchrotron. And therefore, we could usually consider the synchrotron as a time-dependent pattern of external electric and magnetic fields acting on the electron. <laughs> so, in fact, it's not only the synchrotron, but the electronic apparatus that keeps us RF tubes pulsing. Uh, we could, of course, do it that way, but that's inconvenient. We normally replace it by a classical external field. <laughs> and therefore, I will consider uh, time-dependent interaction Hamiltonians. We assume that we can solve the problem exactly if it were not for H prime, and we wish to get a power series expansion for the dynamics in terms of H prime. That's our problem. Thus, we can go first order in H prime, second order in H prime, etc. 
you want, you could put an imaginary small coupling constant in front of H prime and say we are finding a power series expansion in that coupling constant, but I won't bother to do that. This is most easily done by going to a special picture called the interaction picture, which is sort of halfway between the Schrodinger and the Heisenberg picture. Q interaction of T is e to the i h naught T Q Schrodinger of T, which of course Q Schrodinger of zero, e to the minus i h naught T, and P likewise. That is to say, the interaction picture would be the Heisenberg picture if h prime were zero. Of course, like all alternative pictures, <coughs> we must also change the states. Psi of t in the interaction picture is uh, e to the i h naught t psi of t in the Schrodinger picture. The advantage of this is that if h prime were 0, psi of t in the interaction picture would be independent of time, because it would be the Heisenberg picture. Thus, all the time dependence of psi of t comes from the presence of the interaction. And therefore, this is a, it is nice to derive a differential equation for this, which we will then attempt to solve iteratively in perturbation theory, because it will have the property that um, explicitly will have the property that the thing we are computing goes to 0 when h prime goes to 0. Let's derive such a differential equation. i d by dt, psi of t, in the interaction picture. Well, everything will have an e to the i h naught t out in front. So I'll just stick that there. Then I will have, from differentiating the i h naught t, i h naught times psi of t in the Schrodinger picture. Whoops, no, no i h naught minus h naught. And then I will have, differentiating the Schrodinger thing, h naught, I should say, of ps and qs. Plus h of ps, qs, and t. Psi of t in the Schrodinger picture. No question there, that's just straightforward differentiation of a product. However, I would like to get a differential equation for psi of t in the interaction picture. So therefore, I'll use the equation that defines the connection between the two pictures. E to the minus i h naught of t. h minus h naught is h prime. P s q s t e to the minus i h naught t psi of t in the interaction picture. It's down there by the corner, but I hope all of you can follow it. E to the i, was it i or minus i on the left? I can't read. I plus i. H naught t, h prime of p s q s and t, e to the minus i h naught t, can of course be written as h prime of p i, q i and t from the definition of p i and q i. 
which I will call for shorthand simply h sub i of t. h sub i, as this equation says, is the same function of the interaction picture p's and q's as the Schrodinger Hamiltonian is of the Schrodinger interaction Hamiltonian h prime is of the Schrodinger picture p's and q's. Thus, our differential equation becomes i d by dt psi of t i equals h i of t Yes, sir. Yes, H, we will always do perturbation theory for the case where H0 is time independent. It's different if H0 is time dependent? Well, it's not really that different. Instead of E the minus I H naught T, I'd have U naught. The final equation would be the same. The final equation would be the same. I would have u naughts in the definition, but the final equation would be the same. OK? <clears throat> Any other questions? This is a key equation. Oh, you have a question, but I started a remark, so I'll make the remark. This is a key, key equation because by solving it in, iteratively, as we will shortly, we will obtain the uh, solution to the time evolution problem in a power series in HI. Now, there was a question from the gentleman over there. Yes, sir. Oh, because I imagine expanding this in a power series in PS, I ex insert E to the minus on QS. I insert an E to the minus I H naught T and E to the minus I H naught T between adjacent factors, and then I have the same power series as the term PI and QI. Okay. Stand, I'm sorry, it's a standard sort of manipulation. Notice, please, that even if h prime were time independent, hi might well be time dependent because of the time dependence of pi and qi. Yeah, my question is this. Can you know that, uh, that, that h prime will have a conversion that power series expansion? I will, well, in all the cases we will do, it will be a polynomial. <laughs> OK, we're thinking of things like lambda 5 4 theory. Okay, where it's a where it's a uh, it's a polynomial. Okay, this equ this equation is formal. This equation is formally true modulo ordering ambiguities. E this equation is true modulo ordering ambiguities if it's any function of the p's and q's. If you can define it. Okay, it's just like we write similar equations when we pass from the Schrodinger to the Heisenberg picture. If, all the, if it were only a function of the q's, for example, and all the p's commuted, as so there was no ordering problem since all the q's commute, the equation would be true for any function of the q's. I can't think of any situation, so I can, but the fact that it's true for all the p's commute. No, that's got nothing to do with it. This is an equation at a fixed constant time. The same time appears everywhere. How things behave as time goes to infinity is a different question about which we will devote much thought as court time goes. Yeah. Well, most cases we will. Yeah. Well, in most cases it will be something like five to the fourth, which there will be an infinite number of Qs, but it will be no higher than fourth order in any one of them. OK, or five to the 24th, doesn't matter. OK? Believe me, we will do things that are much more suspect. This is not anything <laughs> to worry about. <laughs> Now, as usual, we solve this equation by, well, we transform this equation into an operator equation, just as before, by introducing the interaction picture U matrix. <coughs> this is defined as obeying the equation. No, sorry, I made exactly the same mistake I did last time. Psi of t in the interaction picture is ui of t and t prime, psi of t prime in the interaction picture. This, of course, just like the ordinary u matrix, hmm? t prime is a fixed time. 
I'm saying you give me the state of the system in the interaction picture at time uh, 100 BC, and I will tell you the state of the system in 1975. Um, and of course, it obeys similar equations. It's unitary. And one can get from t double prime to t by going through an intermediate time, t prime. From these two equations, one could have derived, one could der one can derive a third, which in fact we could have derived in the earlier case, but it wasn't useful to us. This one will be useful. Ui of t and t prime equals Ui of t prime and t inverse by the bottom equation for t double prime equals t, and therefore is also Ui of t prime and t adjoint. Of course, ui is not an independent entity. It is given in terms of, of ordinary u. And in fact, if we look at t equals 0, when all of our pictures coincide, whoops, I didn't write that down. Bad show. Should be over here someplace, psi of t interaction equals psi, uh, psi of zero interaction equals psi of zero Schrodinger, just as in passing from the Schrodinger to the Heisenberg picture. Um, if we look at t equals zero when all of our pictures coincide and work out what happens, it's easy to see that um, u of t and zero equals e to the i h naught t ui of t and 0. And for other times, things can be reconstructed using the known properties of the u's. And of course, finally, ui obeys a differential equation. i d by dt, ui of t and t prime equals h i of t, u i of t and t prime, and the boundary condition u i of t prime and t prime equals 1, just as in the development for the Schrodinger picture. Are there any questions about this? Our task will now be to solve this differential equation, i.e. find a formal power series solution for it, which is equivalent to solving the dynamics in the interaction picture, or in other words, or um, uh, to by this formula to solving the dynamics in any picture. If we were doing the very simplest kind of quantum mechanical system, that is to say a quantum mechanical system with a one-dimensional Hilbert space, then the solution would be trivial. The solution would be ui of t and t prime equals exponential integral from t prime to t dt double prime hi of t double prime. And I guess I better put a minus i there, otherwise I would be make, making a false statement even in the one-dimensional case. Unfortunately, HI is not a one-by-one one matrix. It is indeed an infinite-by-infinite infinite matrix in most cases. And HIs at different times do not commute with each other. So this formula is false. If we try and do the differentiation to make things grow out, we'll find after we differentiate, we get all sorts of factors inside other factors, and we can't drag them out onto the left where they want to be. I will take care of this difficulty by redefining the exponential 
That is to say, by redefining what I mean by the ordering of the operators, I will introduce a new ordering, rather like the norm parallel to the normal ordering I introduced earlier, called time ordering. Given a sequence of operators labeled by the times, A of T1, A1 of T1, A2 of T2, dot, 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 AN of TN, I define the time-ordered product of the string of operators equals same thing rearranged. The order of the operators is not the order in which they occur on the blackboard or the sheet of paper or the stone tablets. Same thing rearranged in time order. Of course, there are two time orders, later on the left and later on the right. And the good, uh, good the convention is, thank God, has a simple mnemonic, later on left. So you can all remember it. <laughs> that is to say, the latest time occurs on the left, then the next latest time, and then the next latest time. This time ordering you have seen before for two operators. I defined it in homework problem number one, and that agrees with this def the definition in homework problem number one for the case when there are only two operators. <coughs> the time ordering symbol has um, many advantages um, that it shares with the normal ordering symbol. For example, the order in which you write the operators down inside the bracket is totally irrelevant, since the actual order in which you are to multiply them is determined by the times which they carry, not by uh, the order in which they occur on the board. It is, yes, sir? Hmm? Then the time ordering product is, time ordered product is in fact ambiguous, and there are cases where we have to worry about that ambiguity if the two operators do not commute at equal time. However, we will apply it to HI. All these operators will be HIs. And since HI is commutes with itself at equal times, there is no problem. Okay. The, um, <clears throat> the, um, like the normal order product, I must warn you, the prescription is not compute the ordinary product and then do something to it, mysterious, the operator called time ordering. It is a new way of interpreting those symbols on the blackboard. It is not an operation to apply to the products of the operators. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, that's to keep you from getting into contradictions where you say, suppose these are two free fields, phi of t1, phi of t2. The order doesn't matter, so the normal time ordered product of the commutator is 0. But the commutator is a number, and how can the time ordered product of a number be 0? That's false reasoning. It is not compute the product as an operator and then do something to that operator. It is rearrange the terms and then evaluate the operator. I will now demonstrate that the real solution to our problem is the following beautiful formula. In fact, it's so beautiful, I want to say so much about it, that I'll, since I've got the differential equation I want, I have a big board here. Do the Dyson, UI, of t and t prime equals the time ordered exponential of minus i integral from t prime to t dt double prime hi of t double prime. Almost the same formally as the other formula. Except, of course, it defines a completely different operator because everything is to be time ordered. This is called Dyson's formula.
I will discourse for a little while on the meaning of the formula and then show you that it solves the equation. Oh, an important thing I should have told you, this formula is valid only if t is greater than t prime. It is not a true formula otherwise. Fortunately, that presents no difficulties because if we know how to compute ui for one ordering, we know from this formula how to compute it for the other ordering. That's why I wrote that down. Now, this formula is only interpretable as a formal power series. It's not compute the integral, find out what operator that is, exponentiate it, and then do something. This formula, I will write out the first three terms in the power series, just to emphasize that. The first term is 1, and the time ordering symbol does nothing to that. The second term is minus i, and there is just a single time involved. And we have uh, t to t prime, excuse me, dt. Since I'm going to write down more terms, I'll call the integration variable t1, hi of t1. Again, there's a single time, so the time ordering symbol carries no force. The third term, second, the third term is plus minus i squared over 2 factorial, otherwise known as 2, but I write it down so you'll see what the general expression is. Integral from t prime to t double prime, dt1, dt2, hi of t1, hi of t2. And here I can't drop the time ordering symbol because I have two times. Thus, over half the range of integration where t1 is greater than t2, this symbol is to be written at first hi of t1, then hi of t2. Over the other half of the range of integration where t1 is less than t2, the two operators are to be flipped. Plus dot, 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 and I saw a question out of the corner of my eye. Oh, yes. Sorry. Suffering from a surfeit of primes. Other T to T prime. T to T prime. T to T prime. Sorry. Sorry, I did it exactly backwards. Thank you. T prime to T, always the same. Yes, question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Etc. Now, why is this the solution to the equation? Well, let's evaluate its time derivative. It certainly obeys the boundary condition. It's certainly 1 when t equals t prime, because then there's nothing to time order, but, or only 1 to time order, I should say. But what happens, what about the differential equation? Time ordered exponential minus i, integral from t prime to t, Well, inside the time ordering symbol, everything commutes. So in doing our differentiation, we don't have to worry about the orders of the operators. And therefore, we will get just what we would get by differentiating naively. To wit, everything inside the time ordering symbol, hi of t, exponential, minus i, integral t prime to t hi of t double prime dt double prime. That's the result of naive differentiation, and it's the right result because the time ordering symbol takes care of all the orderings for us. Now comes the beauty part. t is the absolute latest time that occurs in anywhere here because the integral runs from t prime to t, and t is greater than t prime. Therefore, this is the left of time that occurs in any time ordering symbol. Latest time, and latest is leftist. <laughs> Therefore, this is always on the left in every term in the power series expansion.
But that is precisely the differential equation we want to produce a solution of, so the argument is complete. This concludes my discussion of um, time-dependent perturbation theory, or how to find the dynamics in a formal power series in an interaction. The answer is Dyson's formula. As it stands, Dyson's formula, although perfectly valid, is rather schematic. And uh, we will beat on it quite a bit, using all sorts of combinatoric tricks to find efficient computational rules. However, the entire content of time-dependent perturbation theory is in this formula. Are there any questions? I have a favor. John, you've been here before, and you're the greater. Could you do me a favor and fill this up with water outside? <laughs> Please. Come on, I've been lecturing since 1.15 without stop. I yeah, if you could go up to the office and get some instant coffee, that would be even better. <laughs> that would keep me going. In fact, if you happen to have a needle full of something. <laughs> okay. Now, our ne I said the next problem we will discuss is scattering theory. Uh, <clears throat> I presume, as always, most of you have taken a course in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. And therefore, you have a general idea of the shape of non-relativistic scattering theory. However, I would like to review certain general features of that theory, just to emphasize certain points so we can see <coughs> what the, um, so to say, the beau ideal of a scattering theory should be, what criteria it should match, may, uh, and then we will try and construct eventually such a, a description of scattering in uh, relativistic quantum mechanics, and therefore we review it, emphasizing imp features that are important for our purposes that might not have been considered important by whoever taught you non-relativistic quantum mechanics and so may be new to you or only half known. Um, what I mean by a scattering theory, an ideal scattering theory, is a description of scattering, of what information you have to drag out of the dynamics to compute cross-sections or whatever you're interested in computing, that makes no reference whatsoever to perturbation theory. Okay, then you know what a scattering, if you could solve the problem you would exactly, if you could find the U-matrix exactly, you'd have a machine, you'd feed it in, you'd turn the crank, and you would f pull out the cross-sections. You cannot solve the U-matrix except for the U-matrix exactly in typical cases, you might, for example, only be able to solve for it in perturbation theory. And then, but that's all right. You have an approximate mu matrix. You put it up and you put it into exactly the same machine. You turn the crank, and out comes an approximation for the cross section. This is really the simplest case. And I will assume that V of x goes to zero, say, faster than 1 over r squared, so we don't have to worry about long-range forces. I think it suffices to say it goes to zero faster than 1 over r log r, but forget that. The, uh, <clears throat> what is a scattering pro experiment? Well, first, a scattering experiment involves asymptotics. It involves saying, that if I have this potential localized, say, in the vicinity of this overflowing ashtray, and in the very, very far past, very far from this potential, I prepare a wave packet. And I allow this wave packet to move through space towards the potential. It goes along as if it were a free wave packet until it, or its fringes, since it's spreading out, intersect the potential. And then it goes bananas and wiggles and bounces around in quite complicated ways. As you all know, if you've ever seen this computer-generated motion pictures of a wave packet hitting a square well potential in one dimension. And then after a while, fragments fly, fragments of wave packet fly out in various directions. And again, again, if I look in the very, very far future, I have just a bunch of free wave packets now all moving away from the potential. Thus, the scattering characteristic of a scattering problem is that quite complicated motion at finite times 
interpolates between simple motion, motion according to the free Schrodinger equation, in the far past and the far future. The problem of scattering is a problem of connecting the simple motion in the far past with the simple motion in the far future. Let us phrase these words in equations. Let psi of t, obviously since I talked about wave packets, I better look at the Schrodinger picture, and I will. That's the good thing to do. I won't bother to put S's on things. Let psi of t be a solution of the free Schrodinger equation. Now, and this is, represents the wave packet I have prepared in the far past. There would be, if there were no potential, it would just evolve according to the free Schrodinger equation. But in the very far past, because the wave packet is very far from the potential, it essentially evolves according to the free Schrodinger equation. No, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll give you help with your thesis project now. <laughs> Associated with this is a solution of the exact Schrodinger equation that represents what the wave packet really does, which we call in. Which it's a completely different state, and it is connected to this state by the statement that if I look in the very far past, I can't tell the difference between psi of t and psi n of t. That is to say, limit t goes to minus infinity norm psi of t minus psi in of t equals 0. Psi of t, I emphasize, is a genuine, normalizable wave packet state. I can't make this thing for a plane wave because a plane wave state has no norm. And physically, it doesn't make any sense to talk about, doesn't make any difference whether you go to the far past or the far future, because the plane wave never gets away from the scattering center, since it's infinite in the spatial extent. That is to say, we have this operation of inning that tells us the given a solution to the free Schrodinger equation, that solution of the exact equation, which looks like it in the far past. Well, far past, future, that makes a great deal of difference to human beings, but not much to quantum dynamics. <laughs> so likewise, we can define an operation of outing. t goes to plus infinity psi of t minus psi of t out, also in a solution of the exact Schrodinger equation. Equals 0. Thus, given any solution of the free Schrodinger equation, we know what the solution of the exact equation is that looks like it in the far past. That's the in state. And we know the solution of the exact equation that looks like it in the far future. That is to say, we use free particle states to describe actual interacting particle states. We use them as descriptors. And we know how to associate a state with its descriptor by this equation, the leaning and outing equation. The S matrix, the scattering matrix, acts between the descriptor states. It tells us how to connect, given a state that looks like psi in the far past, what is the probability amplitude that it will look like phi in the far future? That is to say, this is defined to be phi out psi in. The 
the F matrix obeys uh, certain conditions that are obvious. For example, SS adjoint equals S adjoint S equals 1. It could, that just says scattering conserves probability. It also conserves energy if this is a time independent problem. Notice the H is H naught because the energy operator acts on the descriptors, the states that move according to the free equation. How you prove this is to say you compute the expectation value of the energy or any power of energy in the far past. When you can't tell the state, the in state from the free state, you compute it in the far future when you can't tell it from the free state. And then those got to be the same energies. Yes? H naught is P squared over 2M. Sorry. Okay, free particle motion. So much for the scattering theory of a single particle and a potential. I've gone through it not in the quick way, but in the dogmatic way without proving any of these equations because I presume you have seen them before. Although scattering physically <coughs> is defined between um, normalizable wave No, 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 no. Inning and outing connects the free solution to the exact solution. It's in inverse. It's the inverse of the in operation that enables you to get the asymptotes. Yeah, in other words, out and in are the exact solutions at far can be the exact solutions. In and out are exact solutions at all time. That's why I didn't have to put a T in here, because they both evolve according to the exact Schrodinger equation. So their inner product is independent of time. Think of classical scattering in a potential. Here is x and here is t. Okay. The analog of giving an in solution or an out solution, the analog of giving a free motion would of course be giving a straight line motion in classical mechanics. So this is the analog of psi. Here's some motion of the particle in the potential and without the potential. That's the analog of psi. Okay. If the potential is restricted to some finite space-time region, the real motion of the particle looks like this for a certain amount of time. Then the particle enters the potential and it deviates from that. Well, it can't go backwards in time. That's a bit too much of a deviation. And then it comes out again. OK? Again, moving free. This is psi in, the exact motion that looks like psi in the far past. This thing here, OK, is psi out, the exact motion that looks like psi in the far future. OK? okay. Now. Oh, wait, let me ask one other thing up on that. For example, what happens if a particle came in that gets uh, was bent by a field or something? Well, then the, the initial trajectory and the final trajectory in the XD plane wouldn't be parallel. That's right. I, they don't, I just drew them parallel because I was. Yeah, well, there are two separate asymptotes here. It doesn't matter. For every free motion, there is a physical motion that looks like it in the far past, and there is a physical motion that looks like it in the far future. Inning is an operation that turns free motions into physical motions. Yeah. Outing is also an operation that turns free motions into physical motions. These, I drew these parallel. You didn't have, they didn't have to be a time-dependent potential. They don't have to be parallel. It doesn't. We're not going to. We're not going to get this to this stage, and we're going to. Okay, it goes like this. This is what psi does. Oh, sorry, psi is always a straight line. Forgive me. Okay, so this one might have to be sent in at some random angle down here to come out like this. Psi is a fixed free motion. With it, there is associated a motion, psi in, that's an exact motion that looks like it in the far past. 
and a motion psi out. That's an exact motion that looks like it in the far future. Psi in and psi out have absolutely no connection with each other. I could take out a physical motion. Right. Well, you're thinking of the opposite operation. If I throw psi in equals omega psi, well, omega omega is not time reversal. U. Okay. Okay. Then you're thinking of the operation u inverse psi in equals psi, where I take a given physical motion and associate with it an asymptote. I'm, that's not the way I'm doing it. It's a cool. Like yes, OK, good. <laughs> but I mean, you could, I mean, that would be an alternate kind of way. That would be an alternate way of doing it, and it would lead to precisely the same equations in the end, but that's not. That's I, I thought. OK, yeah, but that's not the way I do it. Now, it should be emphasized that this way of doing things links things. We're not going to use all this formalism, by the way, in uh, relativistics theory, at least not in the time being. Uh, links things, looks like there's a connection with perturbation theory, with breaking up the Hamiltonian into an H naught and a V. This is not so. And the easiest way to demonstrate that is to consider another system, simple system. Let's say three particles. of all the same mass, just for simplicity, with central potentials between them. Uh, where those are the usual difference between the centers of the particles. And let me assume that V12 L by itself could make a bound state. That is to say, the center of mass Schrodinger equation, del squared over 2m plus v12 of x. It's not 2 because the center of mass is reduced mass, m over 2 of x, psi naught of x equals epsilon psi naught of x. It has one bound state. And none of the other potentials make bound states. They're all repulsive, and this one has only one. This could be, aside from the long-range nature of the forces, a proton and two a proton and um, let's see, how can I do it? A proton, an electron, and a neutral pi meson. There's no binding between the proton and the neutral pi meson. There's no binding between the electron and the neutral pi meson. But there is binding between the proton and the electron that makes a hydrogen atom. Okay. Of course, a hydrogen atom has an infinite number of bound states. Now here, if we seek for descriptors, we find things fall into two channels, as we say, two sec channels. Um, one in which, in the far past, the state looks like three free particles. And the other of which, in the far past, it looks like one free particle and one bound state of the one and two system. Both of those can happen, since one and two can bind. And if they can bind, if we go into the far past or into the far future, we may find one and two are bound. Therefore, we have two kinds we have states of type one and corresponding in and out states, which are solutions to the exact Schrodinger equation that in the far past and the far future look like three widely separated particles. For them, h naught is just sum of pi squared over 2m. We also have states of type 2, orthogonal exact solutions of the Schrodinger equation, for which a complete basis could be given by giving the momentum of the third particle, which doesn't bind, the combined momentum of the 1-2 pair, which is in a bound state, and that's the second type, so I'll put a 2 there. For these, h naught is 
plus V12. V12 has got to be there, because if it's not there, these free states will not time evolve in the appropriate way. That is, the one and two particle will fly away from each other. It's V12 that keeps them held together. Thus, in this case, with which there are many sectors, what we, two sectors in this case, two channels, there are several alternatives for the free Hamiltonian to put into the definition of the in and out state, depending on what kind of particles we look at. Notice all the in states of this kind are orthogonal to all the in states of this kind, and out to out, because if a particle looks like three widely separated particles in the far past, it is not going to look like one free particle and one bound state in the far past. Its probability for doing that is zero. On the other hand, the in states here are not orthogonal to the out states here, or vice versa. That is to say, ionization can occur. You can scatter a free particle off of a bound state, and in the far future, get three free particles. No. So this shows the situation can be more complicated and have nothing to do with perturbation theory. This is just a review of what I presume you already know from a good course in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. This is the appropriate H naught for states of type 1, and this is the appropriate H naught for states of type 2. Now, what do we expect? What is the bow ideal? What is the grail of a, of a theory in which of a quantum field theory, a relativistic quantum system. What, do, what sort of in-states and out-states do we expect to have? Well, fortunately, we have locality and all that. So we imagine if we have a particle of type zilch, we can have two widely separated particles of type zilch and three widely separated particles of type zilch. So we would expect that our descriptor states would be a bunch of fox space, a fox space for a bunch of free particles that would correspond to one, two, three particles of various kinds, all moving in towards each other or moving away from each other in the far past, all in appropriate wave packets. What kind of particles should be there? Well, all the stable particles in the world, whatever they are. Okay, that's a big list of particles. There's electrons and neutrinos, and there are um, hydrogen atoms and their ground states, and there are photons, and there are alpha particles, and there are ashtrays. Well, we would have to go to quite, that's a stable system. I don't think, I've never seen an ashtray decay. I presume it's a stable system. <laughs> it has a lot of excited states. You can put dimples in it and everything, but it's a sta stable system. Fortunately, we have to go to the quite high center of mass energy we have to, before we begin to worry about ashtray, anti-ashtray production. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. They should all be there, and there should be a great big Fox space where we can have that describes states of one electron, 17 photons, 14 protons, four alpha particles, and six ashtrays. Okay. And then there would be some S matrix that connects them to the other, one to the other. Now, to construct a scattering theory that is capable of handling, a such ends, uh, handling this situation is a tall order. And therefore, after setting up these high hopes, I will make you all groan by describing the simple way we are going to do scattering theory for the first run through in this course. It is going to be a trivial, obviously inadequate definition of scattering theory. Oh, I should have said in our ideal scattering theory, of course, I didn't list a neutron. There's a reason for that. Neutrons don't last forever. They last 18 minutes on the average. So, uh, of course, we never find in the very, very far future a neutron coming out. We find an electron, a uh, proton, and a neutrino coming out, but not a neutron. <laughs> so, uh, so it's all the stable particles in the world. Now, we are eventually going to develop a description that, in principle, will enable us to handle the situation of this complexity. In practice, of course, it's a different story. Just as in practice, it's a very difficult thing to compute ionization here in any sensible approximation. In practice, it's very difficult to use some standard methods of elementary particle physics to compute nucleus-nucleus scattering. Uh, but we will develop a description where if we did know time evolution exactly, we would be able to compute all scattering matrix elements exactly. However, this description takes quite a long time to develop. And there are many features of it that are rather obscure if you are working with no specific examples to think of. 
And therefore, I will use the most hand-handed possible description, the crudest and simplest, of scattering in the first instance. And then as we go along doing examples, we will find places where it obviously has to be fixed up. So we'll add a tail fin to it here and put on an extra carburetor there until to make it work. And then after we've had a lot of experience with this jerry-built machine, I will then go through a sequence of one or two lectures on a very high level of abstraction where I explain what the real scattering theory is like. I do things this way so you can get some particular, a lot of particular examples under your belts before I, uh, before we fly off into an ever, never land, actually an ever, ever land of abstraction. <laughs> so therefore, I will now explain the incredibly crude thing I will do. I will take HI of T and bluntly multiply it by a function of time, depending in a way I will describe on two numbers, T and delta, HI of T. Now, what will this function be like? It will be a so-called adiabatic turning on and off function. It will be equal to 1 for a long time, which I will call t. And then it will slowly make its way to 0 for a time I will call delta. Okay. Now, this is an artificial thing I have stuck in my theory. Why have I stuck it in my theory? Well, if we think of particle scattering in a potential, this makes the computation of the S matrix rather simple. In the far past, when this function is 0, the theory is not in some sense asymptotically equal to a free theory. It's exactly equal to a free theory. So we have a free wave packet going along on its way to the potential. Before, while it's on its way to the potential, we turn on the interaction. But it doesn't know that because it hasn't reached the potential yet. And then it reaches the potential and scatters and falls off in fragments. And after the fragments have all flown away, we carefully turn off the potential again. And again, it doesn't notice that because it's away from the potential. So for scattering of particles in a potential, it's certainly true that we have a very simple formula for the S matrix. We don't have to worry about in states and out states because the in states are the states in the far past. And the out states are the states in the far future. It's simply the limit. T goes to infinity. Delta goes to infinity. We keep it on for a longer and longer time and make the adiabatic turning on and off more and more adiabatic. Delta over T goes to 0 in the limit. So the fringe, the, the transient terms we'd expect to get from the boundaries are trivial compared to the terms we get from keeping the potential on of U of plus infinity minus infinity. Why? Because the interaction picture is well suitable to our purposes when the field that already takes out the factors of either the i, h, naught, t that are in the free evolution of the initial and final state. Okay. This is obviously, physically, no harm in computing the S matrix this way if it were particle scattering in a potential. It may lack something in elegance instead of solving the real problem. You solve a substitute problem with an adiabatic turning on and off function in it, and then let the turning on and off go away. But it certainly corresponds to all the physics we would think would be there. The uh, a question, of course, arises. Well, in the quantum field theory, you'd expect things to be more complicated. In what sense are the particles really non-interacting when they're far from each other? Aren't they survive? Haven't I heard about all those virtual photons that surround the charged particle in Scientific American articles and <laughs> stuff like that? <laughs> Well, we'll worry about that question. But for the moment, we will adopt the supremely simple-minded definition of the S matrix because it enables us to make immediate contact with time-dependent perturbation theory and start computing things. As we compute things, we will find that indeed this thing is too simple-minded, and we will have to systematically fix it up. But we will discover how to fix it up. And meanwhile, we will be doing lots of calculations and gaining lots of intuition. And then finally, we will, re we will junk the model A altogether and replace it with the supreme model of scattering theory. 
So that is the outline of what we will be doing during the next month. And uh, during the next lecture, we will uh, begin exploring this by developing a sequence of algorithms for starting from Dyson's formula, evaluating the U matrix in terms of diagrams, drawings on the board. Come in.